Pay close attention. The news you are about to see is fulfilling Bible prophecy. Welcome to another edition of YPN News, bringing you the news that relates to Bible prophecy and foretold by Yisra Hawkins. Well, in the news today, the U.S. says anyone who deals with Venezuela proceed with caution. Mm. So we'll have those details, including President Nicolas Maduro's response. Also, we're going to be talking about Iran and Russia. They are now planning joint naval drills in the Gulf, saying we have as much right here as anybody else. And we're going to be looking back at the dropping of the atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima as the 74th anniversary rolls around. But first, the latest on the INF Treaty and the arms race that is following. Well, the United States has officially pulled out from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty with Russia because they said Russia had deliberately violated the treaty. Now, Washington and NATO have blamed Russia for the collapse and feel Russia's non-compliance is a threat. Well, Russia has denied any violations and says the U.S. wanted to dissolve the treaty from the first place. Originally, the INF treaty between the two superpowers reduced the ability to launch a nuclear strike at short notice and eliminating medium-range missiles. With the fall of this treaty, it is quickly opening the door for a new arms race along with new missile sites. U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper is currently touring the Asia-Pacific region and region and discussing the United States' ambitions of deploying new missiles in the region. Well, China is warning the U.S. that they will not allow ground-based missiles to be stationed in Asia. Now, with the trade wars continuing, this increased strain could fuel a new arms race between not only Washington and Moscow, but also Beijing. Well, Defense Secretary Mark Esper visited Australia, Japan, and South Korea, which just so occurred to be the same three countries China mentioned they would not sit back and allow missiles to be stationed there. Despite these three countries being U.S. allies, they also consider China as their largest training partner. Chinese Arms Control Director General Fu Kong delivered his warning to the U.S., uh, by saying, we call on the U.S. to exercise restraint. I also want to make one point absolutely clear that China will not stand idly by and will be forced to take countermeasures should the U.S. deploy intermediate-range ground missiles in this part of the world. Well, China has not yet announced what countermeasures they would take if the U.S. deploys missiles in their region, but they did say they have no interest in arms control talks with the U.S. and Russia. Now, President Donald Trump contradicted those statements, claiming China was very excited about taking part in these talks. Well, Nikolai Petrushev, Secretary of Russian Security Council, could not see a way to involve China in these talks, stating the Americas mentioned that it would be good if the INF Treaty is multilateral and mentioned China as one potential party. And we know that China said they don't want to partake in the process. And why China if we are talking about a multilateral treaty? Why aren't the UK or France taken into account? Uh, the Trump administration has argued that the Russian-American arms agreement was outdated in the context of a rising China. The U.S. pulled out of the treaty, treaty excuse me, citing Russian violations, even though Russia has uh, invited the U.S. to see the Russian missiles themselves, the U.S. refused the visitation, and President Vladimir Putin has called for urgent talks to prevent a chaotic arms race. Many believe the real reason the U.S. pulled out of the INF was for its own military expansion and the need to counter China's advancement in missile technologies, and that the U.S. needs to improve the effectiveness of their own anti-missile system. Now, currently, China has an estimated of 290 nuclear warheads deployed, compared with 1,600 for Russia and 1,750 
for the U.S. Wow. Well, Mark Esper, the newly appointed U.S. Defense Secretary, wasted no time in planning his moves, stating, it's fair to say, though, what we would like to deploy a capability sooner rather than later. I would prefer months. I just don't have the latest state of play on timelines. Uh, Russia's President Putin quickly warned the U.S. by saying, if we receive verified information that the U.S. has finished deploying or excuse me, developing and started producing these systems, Russia will be forced to begin its own full-scale development of similar missiles. Hence the arms race. That's right. If one does it, we'll have to do it too. Mm -hmm. Well, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo commented, I think our efforts to deploy our resources, our defense resources, to create deterrence and stability around the world is something we're always looking at. Now, Washington has openly said we don't want, uh, that they don't want their arsenals to be limited by any laws that don't put any restrictions on the Chinese military. So, Katan, that leaves little doubt that countering China is what the U.S. was seeking from the start. Hmm, interesting. Well, with the INF dissolved, Pompeo and Esper flew over to the Asia-Pacific region to do some talking. The Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison tried to calm the public down as they worried the U.S. might ask them to install missiles in northern Australia, dragging them in the middle of a nasty conflict. He stated, that's not something the government would consider. It's not being asked of us. It's not being considered. It's not being put on us. So I think I can rule a line under that. Well, one final note on the new U.S. Defense Secretary. Uh, Mark Esper's prior lobbying for one of the U.S.'s biggest contractors, Raytheon, led to a few uncomfortable questions at the confirmation hearing. Uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren questioned Mark Esper, saying, Secretary Esper, prior to becoming Army Secretary, you were, at the, you were the top lobbyist for Raytheon. Uh, that's a conflict of interest, given that Raytheon does billions of dollars worth of business every year with the Defense Department. Now, she continued, when you left as their top lobbyist, there was at least a million dollars in deferred compensation. This smacks of corruption, plain and simple. I want to know, will you commit not to work for or get paid by any defense contractor for at least four years after your government service? Hmm. Well, Mr. Esper's response, no, Senator, I will not. Hmm. How about that? Yeah. Well, speaking of China, China believes the U.S. is responsible for the unrest they're experiencing there in Hong Kong and issued a strong warning against the U.S. Now, Larry McGee has the details. Larry, is this true? The hostilities between Beijing and Washington have opened a new front, or at least that is the suspicion being asserted by China. The Asian powerhouse recently released photos of some of its militia preparing to combat rioters in Hong Kong. Beijing believes that the U.S. is attempting to employ destabilization tactics similar to those used to weaken and conquer various Middle East nations through protests and uprisings, and they don't intend to go for it. In a statement released by China's foreign ministry, spokeswoman Hu Chongying stated, that, as you all know, they, speaking about the Hong Kong protesters, are somehow the work of the U.S. The spokesperson said further that China will never allow any foreign forces to interfere in the city and issued the warning that those who play with fire will only get themselves burned. In a way, it must have burned not having what many people suspect was a coup attempt in Venezuela go smoothly, but America, the nation believed to have orchestrated the effort, is not admitting defeat just yet. National Security Advisor John Bolton is continuing the U.S. press through coercion and intimidation to scare off any nation that might think to help Caracas. In a message delivered in Peru, Advisor Bolton spoke directly to any leaders who might be sympathetic to the Bolivarian cause, advising that they proceed with extreme caution and not risk their business interests with the U.S. for the purpose of profiting from what he called a corrupt and dying regime. The diplomat said that America seeks the peaceful transfer of power, but quoted President Trump in saying that all options are on the table. China 
who has continued friendly relations with the embattled nation despite U.S. threats, released a statement stating that the U.S. is wantonly interfering in Venezuela's foreign affairs. In the message, Beijing also urged Washington to allow the Venezuelan people to decide their own future and immediately stop the bullying actions of suppressing other nations at every turn. Meanwhile, advisor Bolton has gone on record as calling China and Russia support for the democratically elected government of Venezuela as intolerable. And speaking on the matter, the head of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, called advisor Bolton a fascist. And in a bid to offset sanctions, the embattled leader is presently working on a lucrative oil deal with China. China is set to use its silk and or belt and road initiative to prepare Venezuelan oil refineries. In exchange, Caracas has has reportedly agreed to tender certain oil products, including diesel. The deal is said to be an expression of China's commitment to helping Venezuela, though it is certain that it will not at all help its relationship with America. America's no holds barred approach to the current international struggle for world dominance and supremacy has more than a few world leaders crying foul. The latest is Iran's ambassador to the UN, Majid Ravinci, who was describing recent U.S. sanctions imposed on Iranian Foreign Minister Javid Zarif as a gross violation of international law in the UN's charter. Iran's foreign ministry issued a statement dismissing America's latest action as an unmistakable indication of its frustration. The U.S.'s sanctions on the Persian diplomat place severe restrictions on his travel while he's here in the States. YPN News, I'm Larry McGee. The time, Jeff. Back to you. Yeah, so, so we can definitely see a lot more pressure uh, being put on Iran uh, with U.S. sanctions, uh, not just going for the country, but individuals as right, well. Individuals. Uh, not to mention what uh, Beijing was referring to in regards to what we see taking place in Hong Kong, that this, uh, they feel, is not something that's internal, but an external source persuading the people to rise up in these protests. Right, which is not solely China's perception. There are a lot of other yes. countries that think exactly the that's same correct. way, that somehow... The U.S. is behind that unrest. Mm -hmm. Well, the Russian Navy and the Iranians are planning for several naval exercises in the Strait of Hormuz later this year. The two countries, together with the push from China, are hoping to prove the point that they have just as much right to be there as the Americans, and they want to prove this point also to London. Iran is preparing itself for an attack from the United States, as it has in times past. But, of course, one of the key differences for Iran today compared to 20 to 30 years ago is that Iran is no longer isolated. Well, in India, the autonomous region of Kashmir, administered by the Indian government, was granted its own rights to make laws that govern its region, now that under Article 370. Now, it could make its own laws except when it came to finance, defense, foreign affairs, and communication. Now, that causes the residents of that state to live under different laws from everyone else in India in matters such as property ownership, and citizenship. Well, India is no longer giving special status to India-administered Kashmir. That's right. India is also planning to split up the state. Uh, Jammu and Ladakh uh, will also be receiving some changes uh, there. Uh, there uh, places in, in, in Kashmir. Um, as far as Jammu is concerned, it will have its own assembly, but it will be ran directly from Delhi. Now, Ladakh, which is made up of uh, Buddhists, uh, Jammu mostly uh, Muslims, uh, will have a union territory, but it will not have its own assembly. Now, Kashmir is currently in a state of lockdown with thousands of troops deployed there as uh, uh, a means to uh, squash public protests and of course they've also uh, cut off phone and internet uh, in and the pro Kashmir politicians they've actually been put on house arrest now uh, the country is warning Buddhist tourists to leave um, the area because of fear of attacks and of course shelling has occurred along the line of control between is India controlled Kashmir and Pakistan? Of course, Pakistan is also accusing India of using uh, the uh, outlawed cluster bombs, which, of course, India has denied. Well, as we mentioned, 74 years ago, Nagasaki and Hiroshima were bombed, causing approximately a quarter of a million people to be slaughtered by the use of atomic bombs. 
Now, fears still linger even more so today with the death of the INF Treaty and more powerful bombs are in the possession of a lot more countries than ever before. Dr. Timon Wallace, the executive director of Nuclear Ban, joined RT for an interview to discuss that very topic. Now, regarding the cities that were destroyed with atomic weapons, he said, of course the cities are rebuilt and they're bustling, uh, people are still living there, just like Berlin and so forth, but in the case of atomic bombs, the impact is still there. Mm -hmm. uh, the doctor continued, people are still dying in the areas hit with the atomic bombs because acute uh, doses of radiation kill quickly, while lower levels of radiation kill for decades, causing cancer some 30 to 40 years later. The Japanese government has kept names and the numbers of those people affected and who have died as a result of these bombs uh, being dropped uh, on those two cities, and that number today is well over 400,000 compared to that 250,000 74 years ago. So with uh, atomic or better yet nuclear bombs today, you have a twofold punch with the immediate deaths and the residual that comes even years after the spike levels of radiation die down for years to come. And, and with the, the nuclear bombs that we have today being much more powerful than the atomic bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it would be, a, it's a wonder how long they, those today would go on killing yeah. if 74 years they're still feeling the effects of those two atomic bombs. Yeah, so, so to speak, you know, they only have one experiment, so to speak, that they've completed 74 years ago, and those were with bombs that are considered tiny in smaller. comparison to the small uh, nuclear bombs that we do have, Russia having some... 1600 in the United States having some 700 and 1750 so we don't have anything to show what the effects will be years down the road until it actually takes place. Well in Israel the blue and white party the only real threat to Netanyahu's office co-led by Yair Lapid had a recent interview with I-24 News to talk about the peace plan and his party's actions. Now regarding the peace plan he said the economical part of the plan made some sense to him because it's a good thing to approach the young Palestinians to tell them the problem you have is with the stubbornness of your leadership and you need to look at the benefits and incentives that we're going to offer you if the leadership will listen. The political leg of the plan is still unclear to him, but he sees the U.S. trying to get the Sunnis more involved, which is a great idea, something he's supported since 2015. Uh, he said a more regional approach, but we don't know the ramification of what they're going to say. Uh, Mr. Lapid said that whoever wins the Israeli election, of course he hopes it's he, you know, his party, uh, is going to work well with the American administration. And the reason he knows this, he said, is because the history of the relationship has always been a good one. The Clinton-Rabin quote-unquote love affair uh, was even stronger than the Trump-Netanyahu relationship is today. Even Reagan, he said, worked well with Israel. So he concluded by saying, whoever gets in uh, in Israel, the U.S. and the Israelis will continue to work well together. And he seems pretty confident of that. And, of course, he's uh, one of the few people that said that, you know, um, you know if, he is, if he's elected, he's definitely going to push this mm -hmm. peace plan. Uh, and, of course, we're, you know, it's kind of quiet, but still, uh, internationally, all eyes are still kind of on the region in the Middle East area over there because a lot of that affects what we see what takes place on a global scale a lot taking place in that area of the earth including what we see down in Iran as well and what's going on in the Strait of Hormuz and that that push and pull between the United States Russia and Iran and of course China's getting involved in this as well if not directly they're pushing or behind other countries you know the smaller areas like like Iran and of course Venezuela and, and so it's just kind of uh, creating an atmosphere of just tension uh, between the U.S. and a lot of its um, what they consider not necessarily uh, enemies, but not friends either. Right. Yeah. But with that peace plan, if Yair Lapid was to get in office, it sounds like he would be uh, very much in favor of the peace plan and want to push it forward, whereas even Benjamin Netanyahu in a close relationship with Washington, it seems like he still has some things that he kind of wants to... Uh, uh, you know, eliminate from the plan or change, mm -hmm. and whereas, uh, you know, Mr. Lapid is, uh, seems very willing to, hey, let's push this forward, it's a great plan, yeah. 
and he wants to get it going. Yeah, get the Palestinians more involved mm -hmm. in it for sure. Yeah. Well, if you'd like to know more about this time period that we're in and what's taking place in the Middle East, or better yet, in and around the great river Euphrates, as mentioned in your holy scriptures, uh, contact the House of Yahweh and see what is actually prophesied in your holy scriptures thousands of years ago. It's going to take place uh, in a very short period of time and is already taking place right now. And of course, when you contact the House of Yahweh, don't forget to request your free copy of the Prophetic Word magazine and the monthly newsletter. Here's how. To contact the House of Yahweh, you can write them at P.O. Box 2498, Abilene, Texas 79604. You can call them at 1-800-613-9494. Visit them on any of their websites by going to Yahweh.com, YishraelHawkins.com, or Yahweh'sBranch.com. If you'd like, you could visit our website by going to YPNNews.com. Uh, for those of you who would like to email the House of Yahweh, you can do so by emailing info at Yahweh.com. Any international calls, please call the number that's on your screen. And once again, don't forget to check out the Israel Says program by going to YisraelSays.com and the Ask Yisrael program by going to AskYisrael.com. They're absolutely free and guaranteed to increase your knowledge in the Holy Scriptures. Well, don't go anywhere. As you just saw, the world is getting ready to uh, engage in the one hour burning, but uh, stay with us because Yishra Hawkins is bringing forth the waters of life. For all of us here at YPN News, I'm Katan Alexander. And I'm Jeffrey Heimerman. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.